That was from the new documentary, Whose Streets, opening in theaters this weekend. The film chronicles how events unfolded in Ferguson uh, three years ago after unarmed 18-year-old Michael Brown was killed by a white police officer, Darren Wilson. That, of course, was August 2014. It is an up-close and personal look from the viewpoint of Ferguson's black residents and activists. Joining us via Skype from St. Louis are the filmmakers of Whose Streets, Sabah Falan and Damon Davis. Also joining us in D.C. is uh, activist Brittany Packnett of Campaign Zero and, of course, our panel, Dr. Greg Carr, Liz Copeland, and Spencer Overton. Uh, Sabah and Damon, I want to start with you. Uh, you. You wanted to focus on the people of Ferguson, the people who frankly have not gotten lots of attention, who really drove this uh, every day, these daily protests in that city. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we chose to focus on. Um, we were some of those people. Um, we were active in the protest, and um, we just really excited for people to see um, a different point of view, a different perspective about what happened. Sabah, obviously, if you're if you're there, you're living there. It's a different reaction than those folks who traveled to Ferguson, uh, because when folks left, you were still there. Um, so I'm actually from New York, and I did come into Ferguson Sabah? about a. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Uh, did I lose them? Uh oh. Uh, Sabah, keep talking, please. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm from New York, and I came about a month after Mike Brown was killed. And I think, um, you know, what did separate me from other people who came is that I kept coming back, and I stayed for a really long time and got to know this community. But I think it's really important to note that, you know, it was really people who did live here, who wake up here every day, who came out and just wanted to do something about what was going on in their own backyard. What will we learn from this documentary that we already don't know? <clears throat> I think just how much this movement was rooted in love, really. People's love for one another, their love for their families. Um, I think people don't realize how much the activists were balancing and putting at risk when they decided to take on this challenge and try to pursue justice for Mike Brown. They had careers, they had families, um, people fell in love over the, over the course of this movement and really put everything on the line. Um, I want to go to Damon uh, and my last question for you here. Uh, and look, folks have had to deal with the realities of protests. We've seen several activists who've been found shot and killed, burned in cars. Uh, we've seen other people uh, who have been impacted. Uh, three years later, uh, there is still fallout from those protests uh, over those weeks in Ferguson. That's right. That's right. We, <clears throat> we've, we've lost people um, under really suspicious circumstances. We, we, we've lost kids to, to, to prison time. Um, and I just want to say from, from the people that actually live here in St. Louis, I'm one of them that um, this, this threat does not go away. Uh, and and it's, it's hanging over us and it's looming over us every day. But I, I really um, respect and admire everyone um, that keeps pushing. Um, and, and if it wasn't for other people like them, I don't know if I could keep pushing. Damon and Sabah, uh, we appreciate it. The documentary is Whose Streets. It opens in theaters this weekend. Thank you so very much for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Greg Carr, I want to go to you first. Uh, and that is, uh, when we think about uh, what took place here, uh, I was actually here uh, at the Jeffrey Osborne Classic when uh, Ferguson just blew up. And I remember seeing the tweets back and forth and, uh, and then we saw the police action and, and then we saw, of course, uh, the, the, the back and forth to the protests. And what's very interesting to me, we just earlier we talked with the New Orleans city councilman who said they did not get accurate information. They were being lied to by city officials. I still contend one of the reasons this thing really blew up because you had a police chief who would not share information with the residents about what took place. He kept stonewalling, changing his story. And so people became so frustrated with lying and evasive answers from the police that 
that thing just began to get more intense, more intense, and get ratcheted up. Absolutely. As Malcolm X said, as long as you have the ingredients for an explosion, you're going to have the potential for explosion on your hands. And what we see here is cyclical. We see the will, we see the love, we see the, the anger, all ignited because of policy. But at the end of the day, we have to have a plan because institutions don't just respond to these organized formations. And my question as a teacher remains the same. How do we have, what's our vision? for when we win, and how do we engage deep study so that our practice is informed? Because these institutions will continue to do what they do, and there'll be another conflagration, another explosion, because these ingredients haven't been displaced by institutional formation. So I'm, I'm encouraged by these young people, but ultimately, right. we have to really empty this into a vision. And, and this notion of but, 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 institutions responding to citizens, right? That was a huge problem and issue in Ferguson, and, and a huge problem in terms of black folks in this country country generally how can local governments and institutions respond to black folks that's right uh, Brittany I uh, very interesting uh, next year will mark the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission report mm -hmm. uh, that examined the riots of 1967 and and of course the movie Detroit is out uh, incident that happened at the Algiers Hotel uh, and was and if you actually go back if you go back and look at a lot of the race riots, the explosions that happened during the 60s. You look at what happened during the 70s, uprising in numerous cities, there is one consistent thing. Something happened between the community and police. Mm -hmm. Every single time. Uh, I am thinking a lot of the Mexican proverb, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds on today. Mm -hmm. They tried to bury Mike Brown. They tried to bury Sandra Bland. They tried to bury Trayvon Martin. They tried to bury Eric Garner. They tried to bury every single one of us who stood up as Ferguson protesters and were met with tear gas instead of as patriots. Um, but they didn't know we were seeds. And what sprouted, as has already been said, was a, a movement um, fueled by love that is continuously led by the very people that we are not supposed to have movements led by, young folks, black Black folks, queer folks and straight folks, religious folks and non-religious folks, people who are deciding to stand up every single day in every city, especially in Ferguson and continuing in St. Louis, um, and making sure that our voices do not get buried, that our voices do not get silenced. Well, one of the things that I think is important, especially as you already have pointed to history, that despite popular opinion, we have and are continuing to do a lot of the things both on the protest front and on the policy front. We know that this is an inside and outside game, that it is just as important to disrupt in the streets and make institutions pay attention, and then as they pay attention, give them the plan. That's why we created Mapping Police Violence, to make sure that the data was there. That's why we created Campaign Zero, to make sure that the plan was there. That's why people in St. Louis have been running um, candidates like Tashara Jones, who came just 888 votes shy of being our most progressive Mayor in St. Louis's history. That's why the Ferguson City Council is more diverse. There's still plenty more to go, we know, because the police have already killed at least 160 black people in 2017 across the country alone. St. Louis just killed Isaiah Hammett in a, in a no-knock raid um, just this past week. So there's clearly plenty of more work to do, but we're very clear that we have to use every single tool in our toolbox to win. It, Liz, it's very interesting when you look at uh, folks like those uh, right-wing hacks over at Media Research Center in Newsbusters who complain that, oh, how dare we at TV One, News One Now, uh, highlight uh, and complain about black folks who are being killed, but it's not like they're saying anything at all. And then, of course, they say, well, more whites have been killed than anybody else. And I go, well, look, y'all want to act like black folks are only the only people on welfare, and more whites are on welfare as well. This is a response to communities who are saying we are oppressed and it's interesting that people get attitudes when folks stand up for their rights but have no problem when gun folks stand up when it comes to the Second Amendment. Right. You may be surprised, Roland, but often I'm the only person of color when I go to these meetings with other <laughs> Republicans. Uh, and I say that in jest. But no, I'm not surprised. <laughs> not surprised at all. Uh, no but, shock. But the reality is, is that when I talk to other uh, uh, conservatives, they uh, are 
are trying to with uphold the principles of uh, the rule of law and supporting law enforcement and oftentimes they don't want to have a conversation about the valuation of African American lives or the devaluation of their lives in America and that's a very hard conversation for them to have and as a, a person of color and a Republican I have to force this issue as a Baltimorean I was there when the riots were occurring and I saw as our, our, our uh, colleague to my left was speaking about the change that happened afterwards our city council changed we have seven new members of the city council they're very progressive not to my liking but they are very progressive and they are very in tune with the community and what I saw was not people only complaining about police not complaining bringing to the to the forefront the issue of police brutality but also talking about the institutional systems that we have that harmed African-American men our criminal justice system the lack of employment opportunities economic development opportunities all of those issues came to the forefront but that's not what's talked about in conservative circles they don't talk about and, those issues and, and Greg that's the deal what conservatives love to focus on uh, are buildings being destroyed property being damaged even though they say nothing when white kids go crazy when their team doesn't win an NCAA championship game or in the case of Kentucky when they actually do and it's the exact same thing with Donald Trump and Chicago don't just talk about the violence black folks know there's violence in Chicago black black and brown people know we're the ones who are losing lives but you cannot deal with violence in inner cities if you don't deal with education if you don't deal with housing if you don't deal with poverty, if you don't deal with lack of jobs, and if you don't deal with oppressive police departments who are using African Americans as revenue generators mm -hmm. for these cities. Absolutely, but you've got to believe that those people are people. A cultural conservative is a white nationalist. Dredd and Harriet Scott are buried a few minutes from Ferguson, Missouri. In the Dredd Scott case, the question of citizenship was put at the table, and 160 years later, we still haven't resolved it in this country. So when these young people are here talking about being patriots and Americans, let's be very clear. You're not getting through because the people you're trying to convince do not believe that you are human and that you don't have the same rights as a citizen. The citizenship battle is all around voter suppression. These people don't have a right to vote. It's personal responsibility. And so what we see on the streets of Ferguson and Baltimore and everywhere else, is a struggle around what it means to be an American. And that's why 31-year-olds like Stephen Miller, who used to work for Beauregard Sessions, can get up and talk about keeping people out of this country and people going back where they came from, because at the end of the day, to be a citizen in this country means to be white. It was raised by Dred Scott. 160 years later, we are still grappling with it, and our young people on the front line fighting a battle we have still not won, and I'm not sure if we'll ever win in the United States of America. Not that we don't keep We're struggling weekdays on tv one i will never lie to you oh my god roland martin he doesn't want to talk to us he wants to ignore us uncensored hell no, no. that ain't no cut it boo unapologetic no no that, that is fundamentally false you are wrong unfiltered he wants an america where we all look alike he ain't talking about black people unrelenting you better go work out because you got to fight on your hands news one now with roland martin weekdays at 7 a.m on TV One.